Preface of The Drummer or The Haunted House by Joseph Addison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface Having recommended this play to the town and delivered the copy of it to the bookseller, I think myself obliged to give some account of it. It had been some years in the hands of the author, and falling under my perusal, I thought so well of it that I persuaded him to make a few additions and alterations to it, and let it appear upon the stage. I own I was very highly pleased with it, and liked it the better, for the want of those studied similes and repartees which we who have writ before him have thrown into our plays, to indulge and gain upon a false taste that has prevailed for many years in the British theatre. I believe the author would have fallen into this way a little more than he has, had he, before the writing of it, been often present at theatrical representations, and observed the effect that such ornaments generally have upon the town. I was confirmed in my thoughts of the play by the opinion of better judges to whom it was communicated, who observed that the scenes were written very much after Moliere's manner, and that an easy and natural vein of humour ran through the whole. I do not question but the reader will discover this, and see many beauties that escape the audience, the touches being too delicate for every taste in a popular assembly. My brother sharers were of opinion, at the first reading of it, that it was like a picture in which the strokes were not strong enough to appear with advantage at a distance. As it is not in the common way of writing, the approbation was at first doubtful, but has risen every time it has been acted, and has given an opportunity in several of its parts for as just and good action as I ever saw on the stage. The reader will consider that I speak here as the patentee, for which reason I forbear being more particular in the character of this play, lest I should appear like one who cries up the wares of his own shop to draw in customers. Richard Steele Dramatis Personae Sir George Truman, read by Larry Wilson Tinsel, read by Thomas Peter Phantom, the drama, read by Son of the Exiles Vellum, Sir George Truman Steward Read by Todd The Butler, read by T.J. Burns Coachman, read by Campbell Shelp Gardener, read by Alan Mapstone Lady Truman, read by Beth Thomas Abigail, read by Avayi Stage Directions, read by Devora Allen The Prologue in this grave age when comedies are few we crave your patronage for one that's new though twere poor stuff yet bid the author fare and let the scarceness recommend the wear long have your ears been filled with tragic parts blood and blank verse have hardened all your hearts if e'er you smile tis at some party strokes round heads and wooden shoes are standing jokes the same conceit gives claps and hisses birth you're grown such politicians in your mirth for once we try though tis i own unsafe to please you all and make both parties laugh the author anxious for his fame to-night and bashful in his first attempt to write lies cautiously obscure and unrevealed like ancient actors in a mask concealed censure when no man knows who writes the play were much good malice merely thrown away the mighty critics will not blast for shame a raw young thing who dares not tell his name good-natured judges will the unknown defend and fear to blame lest they should hurt a friend each wit may praise it for his own dear sake and hint he writ it if the thing should take but if you're rough and use him like a dog depend upon it he'll remain incog if you should hiss he swears he'll hiss as high and like a culprit join the hue and cry if cruel men are still averse to spare these scenes, they fly for refuge to the fair. Though with a ghost our comedy is heightened, ladies, upon my word, you shan't be frightened. Oh, tis a ghost that scorns to be uncivil, a well-spread, lusty, jointure, hunting devil, an amorous ghost that's faithful, fond, and true, made up of flesh and blood as much as you. Then every evening come in flocks, undaunted, we never think this house is too much haunted. End of preface. Act One of The Drummer 
or The Haunted House by Joseph Addison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act One A Great Hall. Enter the butler, coachman, and gardener. There came another coach to town last night that brought a gentleman to inquire about this strange noise we hear in the house. This spirit will bring a power of custom to the George. If so be he continues his pranks, I design to sell a pot of ale and set up the sign of the drum. I'll give matter morning. That's flat. I've always lived in sober families. I'll not disparage myself to be a servant in a house that is haunted. I'll e'en marry now, and rent a bit of ground of me own, if both of you leave madam. Not but that madam's a very good woman, if Mistress Abigail did not spoil her. Come, here's her health. It's a very hard thing to be a butler in a house that is disturbed. He made such a racket in the cellar last night that I'm afraid he'll sour all the beer in my barrels. Why then, John? We ought to take it off as fast as we can. Here's to you. He rattled so loud under the tiles last night that I verily thought the house would have fallen over our heads. I durst not go up into the cockloft this morning if I had not got one of the maids to go along with me. I thought I heard him in one of my bedposts. I marvel, John, how he gets into the house when all the gates are shut. Why, look ye, Peter. Your spirit will creep you into an auger hole. He'll whisk you through a keyhole without so much as justling against one of the wards. Poor madam is mainly frightened, that's certain, and verily believes tis my master that was killed in the last campaign. Out of all manner of question, Robin, tis Sir George. Mr. Abigail is of the opinion it can be none but his honor. He always loved the wars. And, you know, he was mightily pleased from a child with the music of a drum. I wonder his body was never found after the battle. Found? Why, ye fool, is not his body here about the house? Dost thou think he can beat his drum without hands and arms? Tis master as sure as I stand here alive, and I verily believe I saw him last night in the town clothes. Aye? How did he appear? like a white horse. Phew, Robin. I tell you, he has never appeared yet, but in the shape of the sound of a drum. This makes one almost afraid of one's own shadow. As I was walking from the stable the other night without my lanthorn, I fell across a beam that lay in my way, and faith my heart was in my mouth. I thought I had stumbled over a spirit. Thou mightest as well have stumbled over a straw. Why... A spirit is such a little, little thing that I have heard a man who was a great scholar say that he'll dance ye a Lancashire hornpipe on the point of a needle. As I sat in the pantry last night counting my spoons, the candle, methought, burnt blue, and the spade bitch looked as if she saw something. Ay, poor cur, she's almost frightened out of her wits. Ay, I'll warrant you. She hears him many a time and often when we don't. My lady must have him laid. That's certain. Whatever it cost her. I fancy when one goes to market, one might hear of somebody that can make a spell. Why may not the parson of our parish lay him? No, no, no. Our parson cannot lay him. Why not he as well as another man? Why, ye fool, he is not qualified. He has not taken the oaths. Why do you think, John, that the spirit would take the law of him? Faith, I could tell you one way to drive him off. How's that? I'll tell you immediately. Drinks. I fancy Mistress Abigail might scold him out of the house. Ay, she has a tongue that would drown his drum, if anything could. <sighs> this is all froth. You understand nothing of the matter. The next time it makes a noise, I tell you what ought to be done. 
I would have the steward speak Latin to it. Aye, that would do if the steward had but courage. There you have it. He's a fearful man. If I had as much learning as he, and I met the ghost, I'd tell him his own. But alack, what can one of us poor men do with a spirit that can neither write nor read? Thou art always cracking and boasting, Peter. Thou dost not know what mischief it might do thee if such a silly dog as thee should offer to speak to it. For aught I know, he might flay thee alive, and make parchment of thy skin to cover his drum with. Ah, fiddlestick, tell me not. I fear nothing, not I. I never did harm in my life. I never committed murder. I verily believe thee. Keep thy temper, Peter. After supper, we'll drink each of us a double mug. And then let come what will. Why, that's well said, John. An honest man that is not quite sober has nothing to fear. Here's to ye. Why, how if he should come this minute? Here would I stand. Oh, what noise is that? Ha! Where? The devil, the devil, oh no. "'Tis Mistress Abigail. "'Aye, faith, tis she. "'Tis Mistress Abigail. <laughs> "'A good mistake. <laughs> "'Tis Mistress Abigail. "'Enter Abigail. "'Here are your drunken sots for you. "'Is this a time to be guzzling "'when gentry are coming to the house? "'Why don't you lay your cloth? "'How come you out of the stables? "'Why are not you at work in your garden?' Why, yonder's the fine Londoner, and madam fetching a walk together, and me thought they looked as if they should say they had rather have my room than my company. And so, forsooth, being all three met together, we are doing our endeavours to drink this same drummer out of our heads. For you must know, Mistress Abigail, we are all of opinion that one can't be a match for him unless one be as drunk as a drum. I am resolved to give Madam Warning to hire herself another coachman, for I came to serve my master, d'ye see, while he was alive. But do suppose that he has no further occasion for a coach, now he walks. Truly, Mr. Abigail, I must needs say that this same spirit is a very odd sort of a body, after all, to fright madam and his old servants at this rate. And truly, Mistress Abigail, I must needs say, I served my master contentedly while he was living, but I will serve no man living, that is, no man that is not living, without double wages. Ay, tis such cowards as you that go about with idle stories, to disgrace the house and bring so many strangers about it. You first frighten yourselves, and then your neighbours. Frightened? I scorn your words, frighten quotha. What, you sot? Are you grown pot valiant? Frightened with a drum? That's a good one. It will do us no harm, I'll answer for that. It will bring no bloodshed along with it, take my word. It sounds as like a train band drum as ever I heard in my life. Prithee, Peter, don't be so presumptuous. Abigail, aside. Well, these drunken rogues take it as I could wish. I scorn to be frightened. Now I'm in for it. If old dub dub should come into the room, I would take him... Prithee, hold thy tongue. I would take him... The drum beats. The gardener endeavours to get off and falls. Speak to it, it Mistress Abigail. Abigail. Spare my life and take all I have. Make off, make off, good butler, and let us go hide ourselves in the cellar. 
They all run off. Abigail Sola. <sighs> so, now the coast is clear, I may venture to call out my drummer. But first let me shut the door, lest we be surprised. Mr. Fantôme? Mr. Fantôme? Nay, nay, pray come out. The enemy's fled. I must speak with you immediately. Don't stay to beat a parley. The back scene opens and discovers Phantom with a drum. Dear Mistress Nabby, I have overheard all that has been said, and find thou hast managed this thing so well that I could take thee in my arms and kiss thee if my drum did not stand in my way well oh my conscience you are the merriest ghost and the very picture of sir george truman there you flatter me mistress abigail sir george had that freshness in his looks that we men of the town cannot come up to oh death may have altered you you know Besides, you must consider you lost a great deal of blood in the battle. Ay, that's right. Let me look never so pale. This cut across my forehead will keep me in countenance. <gasps> Tis just such a one as my master received from a cursed French trooper, as my lady's letter informed her. It happens, luckily, that this suit of clothes of Sir George's fits me so well. I think I can't fail hitting the air of a man with whom I was so long acquainted. You are the very man. I vow I almost start when I look upon you. But what good will this do me if I must remain invisible? Pray, what good did your being visible do you? The fair Mr. Fantôme thought no woman could withstand him. But when you were seen by my lady in your proper person, after she had taken a full survey of you, and heard all the pretty things you could say, she very civilly dismissed you for the sake of this empty, noisy creature, Tinsel. She fancies you have been gone from hence this fortnight. Why, really, I love thy lady so well, that though I had no hopes of gaining her for myself, i could not bear to see her given to another especially to such a wretch as tinsel well tell me truly mr Fantôme, have not you a great opinion of my fidelity to my dear lady that i would not suffer her to be deluded in this manner for less than a thousand pound thou art always reminding me of my promise thou shalt have it if thou canst bring our project to bear dost not know that stories of ghosts and apparitions generally end in a pot of money why truly now mr Fantôme, i should think myself a very bad woman if i had done what i do for a farthing less dear abigail how i admire thy virtue no, no, Mr. Fantôme. I defy the worst of my enemies to say I love mischief for mischief's sake. But is thy lady persuaded that I am the ghost of her deceased husband? I endeavour to make her believe so, and tell her every time your drum rattles that her husband is chiding her for entertaining this new lover. Prithee, make use of all thy art for i am tired to death with strolling round this wide old house like a rat behind a wainscot did not i tell you twas the purest place in the world for you to play your tricks in there is none of the family that knows every hole and corner in it besides myself ah mistress abigail you have had your intrigues for you must know, when I was a romping young girl, I was a mighty lover of hide-and-seek. I believe by this time I am as well acquainted with the house as yourself. You are very much mistaken, Mr. Fantôme, but no matter for that. Here is to be your station to-night. This is the place unknown to anyone living besides myself, since the death of the joiner. 
who, you must understand, being a lover of mine, contrived the wainscot to move to and fro in the manner that you find it. I designed it for a wardrobe for my lady's cast clothes. Oh, the stomachers, petticoats, commodes, laced shoes, and good things that I have had in it! Pray take care you don't break the cherry brandy bottle that stands up in the corner. Well, Mistress Abigail, I hire your closet of you, but for this one night. A thousand pound, you know, is a very good rent. Well, get you gone. You have such a way with you, there's no denying you anything. I'm thinking how Tinsel will stare when he sees me come out of the wall, for I am resolved to make my appearance to-night. Get you in, get you in. My lady's at the door. Pray take care she does not keep me up so late as she did last night. All depend upon it, I'll beat the tattoo. I'm undone. I'm undone. As he is going in. Mr. Fantôme, Mr. Fantôme, you have put a thousand pound bond into my brother's hands. Thou shalt have it, I tell thee, thou shalt have it. Phantom goes in. No more words. Vanish. Vanish. Enter Lady Truman. Abigail opening the door. Oh, dear madam, was it you that made such a knocking? <sighs> My heart does so beat. I vow you have frighted me to death. I thought verily it had been the drummer. I have been showing the garden to Mr. Tinsel. He's most insufferably witty upon us about this story of the drum. Indeed, madam, he's a very loose man. I'm afraid tis he that hinders my poor master from resting in his grave. Well, an infidel is such a novelty in the country that I am resolved to divert myself a day or two at least with the oddness of his conversation. Ah, madam, the drum began to beat in the house as soon as ever this creature was admitted to visit you. All the while Mr. Fantôme made his addresses to you, there was not a mouse stirring in the family more than used to be. Lady Truman, aside, this baggage has some design upon me, more than I can yet discover. Mr. Phantom was always thy favourite. Aye, and should have been yours too, by my consent. Mr. Phantom was not such a slight fantastic thing as this is. Mr. Phantom was the best built man one should see in a summer's day. Mr. Phantom was a man of honour, and loved you. Poor soul! How has he sighed when he has talked to me of my hard-hearted lady? Well, I had as lief as a thousand pounds you would marry Mr. Fantôme. To tell thee truly, I loved him well enough till I found he loved me so much. But Mr. Tinsel makes his court to me with so much neglect and indifference, and with such an agreeable sauciness. Not that I say I'll marry him. Marry him, quotha! No, if you should, you'll be awakened sooner than married couples generally are. You quickly have a drum at your window. Lady Truman, aside. I'll hide my contempt of tinsel for once, if it be but to see what this wench drives at. Why, suppose your husband, after this fair warning he has given you, should sound you an alarm at midnight. Then open your curtains with a face as pale as my apron, and cry out with a hollow voice, what dost thou in bed with this spindle-shanked fellow? Why wilt thou needs have it to be my husband? He never had any reason to be offended at me. I always loved him while he was living, and should prefer him to any man were he so still. Mr. Tinsel is indeed very idle in his talk, but I fancy, Abigail, a discreet woman might reform him. That's a likely matter indeed. Did you ever hear of a woman who had power over a man when she was his wife, that had none while she was his mistress? Oh, there's nothing in the world improves a man in his complacence like marriage. He is indeed, at present, too familiar in his conversation. Familiar? Madam, in troth, he's downright rude. But that you know, Abigail, shows that he has no dissimulation in him. Then he is apt to jest a little too much upon grave subjects. Grave subjects, he jests upon the church. But that you know, Abigail, may be only to show his wit. Then, it must be owned, he is extremely talkative. Talkative, do you call it? He's downright impertinent. 
but that you know Abigail is a sign he has been used to good company. Then, indeed, he is very positive. Positive? Why, he contradicts you in everything you say. But then you know, Abigail, he has been educated in the inns of court. A blessed education, indeed. It has made him forget his catechism. You talk as if you hated him. You talk as if you loved him. Hold your tongue. Here he comes. Enter Tinsel. My dear widow. Abigail aside. My dear widow, Mary, come up. Let him alone, Abigail. So long as he does not call me my dear wife, there's no harm done. I have been most ridiculously diverted since I left you. Your servants have made a convert of my booby. His head is so filled with this foolish story of a drummer that I expect the rogue will be afraid hereafter to go upon a message by moonlight. Ah, Mr. Tinsel, what a loss of billet doux would that be to many a fine lady? Then you still believe this to be a foolish story? I thought my lady had told you that she had heard it herself. Ha, 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 ha. Why, you would not persuade us out of our senses? Ha, 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 ha. Abigail, aside. There's manners for you, madam. Admirably rallied. That laugh is unanswerable. Now I'll be hanged if you could forbear being witty upon me, if I should tell you I heard it no longer ago than last night. Fancy. But what if I should tell you my maid was with me? Vapours, vapours. Pray, my dear widow, will you answer me one question? Had you ever this noise of a drum in your head, all the while your husband was living? And pray, Mr. Tinsel, will you let me ask you another question? Do you think we can hear in the country as well as you do in town? Believe me, madam, I could prescribe you a cure for these imaginations. Don't tell my lady of imaginations, sir. I have heard it myself. Hark thee, child. Art thou not an old maid? Sir, if I am, it is my own fault. Whims, freaks, megrims. Indeed, Mistress Abigail. Mary, sir, by your talk one would believe you thought everything that was good is a megrim. Why, truly, I don't very well understand what you meant by your doctrine to me in the garden just now, that everything we saw was made by chance. A very pretty subject indeed for a lover to divert his mistress with. But I suppose that was only a taste of the conversation you would entertain me with after marriage. Oh, I shall then have time to read you such lectures of motions, atoms, and nature, that you shall learn to think as freely as the best of us, and be convinced in less than a month that all about us is chance work. You are a very complacent person indeed, and so you would make your court to me by persuading me that I was made by chance. <laughs> well said, my dear. Why, faith, thou wert a very lucky hit, that's certain. Pray, Mr. Tinsel, where did you learn this odd way of talking? Ah, widow, tis your country innocence makes you think it an odd way of talking. Though you give no credit to stories of apparitions, I hope you believe there are such things as spirits. Simplicity. I fancy you don't believe women have souls, do you, sir? Foolish enough. I vow, Mr. Tinsel, I'm afraid malicious people will say I'm in love with an atheist. Oh, my dear, that's an old-fashioned word. I'm a free thinker, child. I'm sure you are a free speaker. Really, Mr. Tinsel, considering that you are so fine a gentleman, I am amazed where you got all this learning. I wonder it has not spoiled your breeding. To tell you the truth, I have not time to look into these dry matters myself, but I am convinced by four or five learned men, whom I sometimes overhear at a coffee-house I frequent, that our forefathers were a pack of asses, that the world has been in an error for some thousands of years, and that all the people upon earth, excepting those two or three worthy gentlemen, are imposed upon, cheated, bubbled, abused, bamboozled. Madam, how can you hear such a profligate? He talks like the London prodigal. Why, really, I'm a-thinking, if there be no such things as spirits, a woman has no occasion for marrying. She need not be afraid to lie by herself. Ah, my dear, a husband's good for nothing but to frighten away spirits. Dost thou think I could not instruct thee in several other comforts of matrimony? 
Ah, but you are a man of so much knowledge that you would always be laughing at my ignorance. You learned men are so apt to despise one. No, child, I teach thee my principles. Thou shouldst be as wise as I am in a week's time. Do you think your principles would make a woman the better wife? Pretty widow, don't be queer. I love a gay temper, but I would not have you rally things that are serious. Well enough, Faith. Where's the jest of rallying anything else? Abigail, aside. Ah, oh, madam, did you ever hear Mr. Fantôme talk at this rate? But where's this ghost, this son of a whore of a drummer? I'd fain hear him, methinks. Pray, madam, don't suffer him to give the ghost such ill language, especially when you have reason to believe it is my master. That's well enough, Faith, Nab. Dost thou think thy master is so unreasonable as to continue his claim to his relict after his bones are laid? Pray, widow, remember the words of your contract. You have fulfilled them to a tittle. Did not you marry Sir George to the tune of Till Death Us Do Part? Lady Truman aside. I must not hear Sir George's memory treated in so slight a manner. This fellow must have been at some pains to make himself such a finished coxcomb. Give me but possession of your person, and I'll whirl you up to town for a winter, and cure you at once. Oh, I have known many a country lady come to London with frightful stories of a whole house being haunted, of fairies, spirits, and witches— that by the time she had seen a comedy played at an assembly and ambled in a ball or two has been so little afraid of bugbears that she has ventured home in a chair at all hours of the night abigail aside hum saucebox tis the solitude of the country that creates these whimsies there was never such a thing as a ghost heard of at london except in the playhouse oh we'd pass all our time in london "'Tis a scene of pleasure and diversions, where there's something to amuse you every hour of the day. Life's not life in the country.' "'Well, then, you have an opportunity of showing the sincerity of that love to me which you profess. You may give a proof that you have an affection to my person, not my jointure.' "'Your jointure? How can you think me such a dog? But, child, won't your jointure be the same thing in London as in the country?' No, you are deceived. You must know it is settled on me by marriage articles, on condition that I live in this old mansion house and keep it up in repair. How? That's well put, madam. Why, Faith, I have been looking upon this house and think it is the prettiest habitation I ever saw in my life. Aye, but then this cruel drum. Something so venerable in it. Aye, but the drum. For my part, I like this gothic way of building better than any of your new orders. It would be a thousand pities it should fall to ruin. Aye, but the drum! How pleasantly we two could pass our time in this delicious situation. Our lives would be a continued dream of happiness. Come, faith, widow, let's go upon the leads and take a view of the country. Aye, but the drum! The drum! My dear, take my word for it, tis all fancy. Besides, should he drum in thy very bedchamber, I should only hug thee the closer. Clasped in the folds of love, I'd meet my doom, and act my joys, though thunder shook the room. End of Act One Act Two of The Drummer, or The Haunted House, by Joseph Addison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. Scene opens, and discovers Vellum in his office, and a letter in his hand. This letter astonisheth. May I believe my own eyes, or rather my spectacles, to Humphrey Vellum Esquire, steward to the Lady Truman. Vellum, I doubt not but you will be glad to hear your master is alive, and designs to be with you in half an hour. The report of my being slain in the Netherlands has, I find, produced some disorders in my family. I am now at the George Inn, 
If an old man with a gray beard, in a black cloak, inquires after you, give him admittance. He passes for a conjurer, but is really your faithful friend, G. Truman. P.S. Let this be a secret, and you shall find your account in it. This amazeth me. And yet the reasons why I should believe he is still living are manifold. First, because this has often been the case of other military adventurers. Second, because the news of his death was first published in Deere's letter. Thirdly, because this letter can be written by none but himself. I know his hand and manner of spelling. Fourthly, Enter Butler. Sir, he is a strange old gentleman that asks for you. He says he's a conjurer, but he looks very suspicious. I wish he be into Jesuit. Admit him immediately. I wish he be into Jesuit, but he says he's nothing but a conjurer. He says right. He is no more than a conjurer. Ring him in and withdraw. Exit Butler. And fourthly, as I was saying, because... Enter Butler with Sir George. Sir, here is the conjurer. Aside. What a devilish long beard he has. I warrant it has been growing these hundred years. Exit. Dear Valve, you have received my letter. But before we proceed, lock the door. It is his voice. Shuts the door. In the next place, help me off with this cumbersome cloak. It is his shape. So now lay my beard upon the table. Vellum, after having looked on Sir George through his spectacles. It is his face, every liniment. Oh, well now, I have put off the conjurer and the old man. I can talk to thee more at my ease. Believe me, my good master, I am as much rejoiced to see you alive as I was upon the day you were born. Your name was, in all the newspapers, in the list of those that were slain. We have not time to be particular. I shall only tell thee in general that I was taken prisoner in the battle, and was under close confinement for several months. Upon my release, I was resolved to surprise my wife with the news of my being alive. I know, Vellum, you are a person of so much penetration that I need not use any further argument to convince you that I am so. I am. And moreover, I question not but your good lady will likewise be convinced of it. Her honor is a discerning lady. I'm only afraid she should be convinced of it to her sorrow. Is not she pleased with her imaginary widowhood? Tell me truly, was she afflicted at the report of my death? Sorely. How long did her grief last? Longer than I have known any widows. At least three days. Three days, sayest thou? Three whole days? I am afraid thou flatterest me. Oh, woman, woman! Grief is twofold. Sir George, aside. This blockhead is as methodical as ever. But I know he's honest. There is real grief. And there is methodical grief. She was drowned in tears till such time as the tailor had made her widow's weeds. Indeed, they became her. Became her? And was that her comfort? Truly a most seasonable consolation. But I must needs say she paid a due regard to your memory, and could not forbear weeping when she saw company. That was kind indeed. I find she grieved with a great deal of good breeding. But how comes this gang of lovers about her? Her jointure is considerable. Sir George, aside. Ah, oh, how this fool torments me. Her person is amiable. Sir George, aside. Death. But her character is unblemished. She has been as virtuous in your absence as a Penelope. And has had as many suitors. Several have made their overtures. Several? But she has rejected all. There, thou revivest me. But what means this tinsel? Are his visits acceptable? He is young. Does she listen to him? He is gay. Sure she could never entertain a thought of marrying such a coxcomb. He is not ill-made. Are the vows and protestations that pass between us come to this? 
i can't bear the thought of it is tinsel the man designed for my worthy successor you do not consider that you have been dead these fourteen months sir george aside was there ever such a dog and i have often heard her say that she must never expect to find a second sir g truman meaning your honour i think she loved me but i must search into the story of the drummer before i discover myself to her i have put on this habit of a conjurer in order to introduce myself it must be your business to recommend me as a most profound person that by my great knowledge in the curious arts can silence the drummer and dispossess the house i am going to lay my accounts before my lady and i will endeavour to prevail upon her honour to admit the trial of your art i have scarce heard of any of these stories that did not arise from a love intrigue amers raise as many ghosts as murders mistress abigail endeavours to persuade us that tis your honour who troubles the house that convinces me tis a cheat for i think vellum i may be pretty well assured it is not me i am apt to think so truly <laughs> abigail had always an ascendant over her lady and if there is a trick in this matter depend upon it she is at the bottom of it i'll be hanged if this ghost be not one of abigail's familiars mistress abigail has of late been very mysterious ay fancy vellum thou couldst worm it out of her i know formerly there was an amour between you mistress abigail hath her allurements and she knows i have picked up a competency in your honour's service if thou hast all i ask of thee in return is that thou wouldst immediately renew thy addresses to her coax her up thou hast such a silver tongue vellum as twill be impossible for her to withstand besides she is so very a woman that she'll like thee the better for giving her the pleasure of telling a secret in short wheedle her out of it and i shall act by the advice which thou givest me mistress abigail was never deaf to me when i talked upon that subject i will take an opportunity of addressing myself to her in the most pathetic manner in the meantime lock me up in your office and bring me word what success you have ah oh, well sure i am the first that ever was employed to lay himself you act indeed a threefold part in this house you are a ghost a conjurer and my honoured master sir george truman <laughs> you will pardon me for being jocular oh mr vellum with all my heart you know i love you men of wit and humour be as merry as thou pleasest so thou dost thy business mimicking him you will remember vellum your commission is twofold first to gain admission for me to your lady and secondly to get the secret out of abigail it suffices the scene shuts enter lady truman sola women who have been happy in a first marriage are the most apt to venture upon a second but for my part i had a husband so every way suited to my inclinations that i must entirely forget him before i can like another man I have now been a widow but fourteen months, and have had twice as many lovers, all of them professed admirers of my person, but passionately in love with my jointure. I think it is a revenge I owe my sex to make an example of this worthless tribe of fellows who grow impudent, dress themselves fine, and fancy we are obliged to provide for them. But of all my captives, Mr. Tinsel is the most extraordinary in his kind." I hope the diversion I give myself with him is unblameable. I'm sure it is necessary to turn my thoughts off from the memory of that dear man who has been the greatest happiness and affliction of my life. My heart would be a prey to melancholy if I did not find these innocent methods of relieving it. Oh, but here comes Abigail. I must tease the baggage, for I find she has taken it into her head that I am entirely at her disposal. Enter Abigail. Madam, madam yonder is mr tinsel has as good as taken possession of your house mary he says he must have sir george's apartment enlarged for truly says he i hate to be straitened nay he was so impudent as to show me the chamber where he intends to consummate as he calls it well he is a wild fellow 
Indeed, he's a very sad man, madam. He's young, Abigail. Tis a thousand pities he should be lost. I should be mighty glad to reform him. Reform him? Mary, hang him. Has not he a great deal of life? Aye, enough to make your heart ache. I dare say thou thinkest him a very agreeable fellow. He thinks himself so. I'll answer for him. He's very good-natured. He ought to be so, for he's very silly. Dost thou think he loves me? Mr. Fantôme did, I'm sure. With what raptures he talked. Yes, but twas in praise of your jointure house. He has kept bad company. They must be very bad indeed, if they were worse than himself. I have a strong fancy a good woman might reform him. It would be a fine experiment if it should not succeed. Well, Abigail, we'll talk of that another time. Here comes the steward. I have no further occasion for you at present. Exit Abigail. Enter Vellum. Madam, is your honour at leisure to look into the accounts of the last week? They rise very high. Housekeeping is chargeable in a house that is haunted. How comes that to pass? I hope the drum neither eats nor drinks. But read your account, Vellum. Vellum, putting on and off his spectacles in this scene. A hogshead and a half of ale. It is not for the ghost's drinking, but your honour's servants say they must have something to keep up their courage against this strange noise. They tell me they expect a double quantity of malt in their small beer, so long as the house continues in this condition. At this rate, they'll take care to be frightened all the year round, I'll answer for them. But go on. Item, two sheep and a... Where is the ox? Ah, here I have him. And an ox. Your honour must always have a piece of cold beef in the house for the entertainment of so many strangers who come from all parts to hear this drum. Item, bread, ten peck loaves. They cannot eat beef without bread. Item, three barrels of table beer. They must have drink with their meat. Lady Truman, aside. Sure, no woman in England has a steward that makes such ingenious comments on his works. Item, to Mr. Tinsel's servants, five bottles of port wine. It was by your honour's order. Item, three bottles of sack for the use of Mistress Abigail. I suppose that was by your own order. We have been long friends. We are your honour's ancient servants. Sack is an innocent cordial, and gives her spirit to chide the servants when they are tardy in their business. <laughs> Pardon me for being jocular. Well, I see you'll come together at last. Item, a dozen pound of watch lights for the use of the servants. For the use of the servants? What, are the rogues afraid of sleeping in the dark? What an unfortunate woman am I. This is such a particular distress. It puts me to my wit's end. Vellum, what would you advise me to do? Madam, your honour has two points to consider. Imprimis, to retrench these extravagant expenses which so many strangers bring upon you. Secondly, to clear the house of this invisible drummer. This learned division leaves me just as wise as I was. But how must we bring these two points to bear? I beseech your honour to give me the hearing. I do, but prithee, take pity on me and be not tedious. I will be concise. There is a certain person arrived this morning, an aged man of a venerable aspect, and of a long hoary beard that reaches down to his girdle. The common people call him a wizard, a white witch, a conjurer, a cunning man, a necromancer, a... No matter for his titles, but what of all this? Give me the hearing, good my lady. He pretends to great skill in the occult sciences, and has come hither upon the rumour of this drum. If one may believe him, he knows the secret of laying ghosts or of quieting houses that are haunted. Foe, these are idle stories to amuse the country people. This can do us no good. It can do us no harm, my lady. I dare say thou dost not believe there is anything in it thyself. I cannot say I do. There is no danger, however, in the experiment. Let him try his skill. If it should succeed, we are rid of the drum. If it should not, we may tell the world that it has and by that means, at least, get out of this expensive way of living, so that it must turn to your advantage one way or another. I think you argue very rightly, 
but where is the man i would fain see him he must be a curiosity i have already discoursed him and he is to be with me in my office half an hour hence he asks nothing for his pains till he has done his work no cure no money that circumstance i must confess would make one believe there is more in his art than one would imagine pray vellum go and fetch him hither immediately i am gone he shall be forthcoming forthwith exeunt enter butler coachman and gardener rare news my lads rare news what's the matter hast thou got any more veils for us no tis better than that is there another stranger come to the house ay such a stranger as will make all our lives easy what is he a lord a lord no nothing like it he's a conjurer a conjurer what is he come a wooing to my lady no no you fool he's come a purpose to lay the spirit ay mary that's good news indeed but where is he he's locked up with the steward in his office they are laying their heads together very close i fancy they are casting a figure pretty john what sort of creature's a conjurer why he's made much as other men are if it was not for his long gray beard look ye peter it stands with reason that a conjurer should have a long gray beard for did ye ever know a witch that was not an old woman why i remember a conjurer once at a fair that to my thinking was a very smock-faced man and yet he spewed out fifty yards of green ferret i fancy john if thou's get him into the pantry and give him a cup of ale he'd show us a few tricks dost think we couldn't persuade him to swallow one of thy case knives for his diversion he'll certainly bring it up again peter thou art such a wiseacre thou dost not know the difference between a conjurer and a juggler this man must be a very great master of his trade his beard is at least half a yard long he's dressed in a strange dark cloak as black as coal your conjurer always goes in mourning is he a gentleman had he a sword by his side no no he's too grave a man for that a conjurer is as grave as a judge but he had a long white wand in his hand you may be sure there's a good deal of virtue in that wand i fancy tis made out of witch elm i warrant you if the ghost appears he'll whisk you that wand before his eyes and strike you the drumstick out of his hand no the wand look ye is to make a circle and if he once gets the ghost in a circle then he has him let him get out again if he can a circle you must know is a conjurer's trap but what will he do with him when he has him there why then he'll overpower him with his learning if he can once compass him and get him in lobs pound he'll make nothing of him but speak a few hard words to him and perhaps bind him over to his good behaviour for a thousand years ay ay he'll send him packing to his grave again with a flea in his ear i warrant him no no i would advise madam to spare no cost if the conjurer be but well paid he'll take pains upon the ghost and lay him look ye in the red sea and then he's laid for ever ay mary that would spoil his drum for him why john there must be a pair of spirits in that same red sea only warrant you there is plenty of fish well i wish after all that he may not be too hard for the conjurer i'm afraid he'll find a tough bit of work on't i wish the spirit may not carry a corner of his house off with him as for that peter you may be sure that the steward has made his bargain with the cunning man beforehand that he shall stand to all costs and damages but hark 
Yonder is Mistress Abigail. We shall have her with us immediately if we do not get off. Ay, lads, if we could get Mistress Abigail well laid to, we should lead merry lives. For to a man like me, that's stout and bold, a ghost is not so dreadful as a scold. End of Act Two Act Three of The Drummer or The Haunted House by Joseph Addison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three Scene opens and discovers Sir George in Vellum's office. Ah, I wonder I don't hear of Vellum yet, but I know his wisdom will do nothing rashly. The fellow has been so used to form in business that it has infected his whole conversation. But I must not find fault with that punctual and exact behavior which has been of so much use to me. My estate is the better for it. Enter Vellum. Well, Vellum, I'm impatient to hear your success. First, let me lock the door. Will your lady admit me? If this lock is not mended soon... It will be quite spoiled. Prithee, let the lock alone at present, and answer me. Delays in business are dangerous. I must send for the smith next week, and in the meantime we'll take a minute of it. But what says your lady? This pen is not, and wants mending. Uh, my lady, did you say? Does she admit me? I have gained admission for you as a conjurer. Ah, that's enough. I'll gain admission for myself as a husband. Does she believe there's anything in my art? It is hard to know what a woman believes. Did she ask no questions about me? Sundry. She desires to talk with you herself before you enter upon your business. Uh, but when? Immediately, this instant. Phew, oh, what hast thou been doing all this while? Why didst thou not tell me so? Give me my cloak. Uh, have you met with Abigail? I have not yet had an opportunity of talking with her, but we have interchanged some languishing glances. Let thee alone for that, Vellum. I have formerly seen thee ogle her through thy spectacles. Well, this is a most venerable cloak. After the business of this day is over, I'll make thee a present of it. Twill become thee mightily. <laughs> Would you make a conjurer of your steward? Prithee, don't be jocular. I'm in haste. Help me on with my beard. And what will your honor do with your cast beard? Why, faith, thy gravity wants only such a beard to it. If thou wouldst wear it with the cloak, thou wouldst make a most complete heathen philosopher. Ah, but uh, where's my wand? A fine taper stick. It is well chosen. I will keep this till you are sheriff of the county. It is not my custom to let anything be lost. Come, Vellum, lead the way. You must introduce me to your lady. Thou art the fittest fellow in the world to be a master of ceremonies to a conjurer. Exeunt. Enter Abigail crossing the stage, Tinsel following. Nabby, Nabby, with a so fast child. Keep your hands to yourself. I'm going to call the steward to my lady. What? Goodman Twofold? I met him walking with a strange old fellow yonder. I suppose he belongs to the family too. He looks very antique. He must be some of the furniture of this old mansion house. What does the man mean? Don't think to palm me as you do my lady. Pretty nabby, tell me one thing. What's the reason thou art my enemy? Mary, because I'm a friend to my lady. Dost thou say anything about me thou dost not like? Come hither, hussy, give me a kiss. Don't be ill-natured. Sir, I know how to be civil. Kisses her. Abigail, aside. <sighs> this rogue will carry off my lady if I don't take care. Thy lips are as soft as velvet, Abigail. I must get thee a husband. Ah, now you don't speak idly. I can talk to you. 
I have one in my eye for thee. Dost thou love a young lusty son of a whore? Lord, how you talk! This is a thundering dog. What is he? A private gentleman. Ay, where does he live? In the horse guards. But he has one fault I must tell thee of. If thou canst bear with that, he's a man for thy purpose. Pray, Mr. Tinsel, what may that be? He is but five and twenty years old. Tis no matter for his age if he has been well educated. No man better, child. He'll tie a wig, toss a die, make a pass, and swear with such a grace as would make thy heart leap to hear him. Half these accomplishments will do, provided he has an estate. Pray, what has he? Not a farthing. Abigail, aside. Packs on him, what do I give him the hearing for? But as for that, I would make it up to him. How? Why, look ye, child, as soon as I have married thy lady, I design to discard this old prig of a steward, and to put this honest gentleman I am speaking of into his place. Abigail, aside. This fellow's a fool. I'll have no more to say to him. Hark, my ladies are coming. Depend upon it, Nab. I remember my promise. Abigail, aside. Aye, and so will I too, to your cost. Exit Abigail. My dear is purely fitted up with the maid, but I shall rid the house of her. Enter Lady Truman. Oh, Mr. Tinsel, I am glad to meet you here. I am going to give you an entertainment that won't be disagreeable to a man of wit and pleasure of the town. Aside. There may be something diverting in a conversation between a conjurer and this conceited ass. Tinsel, aside. She loves me to distraction, I see that. Prithee, widow, explain thyself. You must know, here is a strange sort of a man come to town, who undertakes to free the house from this disturbance. The steward believes him a conjurer. Ay, thy steward is a deep one. He's to be here immediately. It is indeed an odd figure of a man. Oh, I warrant you he has studied the black heart. <laughs> is not it an Oxford scholar? Widow, thy house is the most extraordinarily inhabited of any widows this day in Christendom. I think thy four chief domestics are a withered Abigail, a superannuated steward, a ghost, and a conjurer. <laughs> Lady Truman, mimicking Tinsel. And you would have it inhabited by a fifth, who is a more extraordinary person than any of all these four. Tinsel aside. It's a sure sign a woman loves you when she imitates your manner. The halt very smart, my dear. But see, smoke the doctor. Enter Vellum and Sir George in his conjurer's habit. I will introduce this profound person to your ladyship, and then leave him with you. Sir? This is her honor. I know it well. Exit Vellum. Sir George aside, walking in a musing posture. That dear woman, the sight of her unmans me. I could weep for tenderness, did not I at the same time feel an indignation rise in me to see that wretch with her. And yet I cannot but smile to see her in the company of her first and second husband at the same time. Mr. Tinsel, do you speak to him? You are used to the company of men of learning. Old gentleman, thou dost not look like an inhabitant of this world. I suppose thou art lately come down from the stars. Pray what news is stirring in the zodiac? News that ought to make the heart of a coward tremble. Mars is now entering into the first house, and will shortly appear in all his domo dignities. Mars? Prithee, Father Greybeard, explain thyself. The entrance of Mars into his house portends the entrance of a master into this family, and that soon. Do ye hear that, widow? The stars have cut me out for thy husband. This house is to have a master, and that soon. Hark thee, old Gadbury, is not Mars very like a young fellow called Tom Tinsel? Not so much as Venus is like this lady. A word in your ear, doctor. 
These two planets will be in conjunction by and by. I can tell you that. Sir George aside, walking disturbed. Curse on this impertinent fop. I shall scarce forbear discovering myself. Madam, I am told that your house is visited with strange noises. And I am told that you can quiet them. I must confess, I had a curiosity to see the person I had heard so much of. And indeed, your aspect shows that you have had much experience in the world. You must be a very aged man. My aspect deceives you. What do you think is my real age? I should guess thee within three years of Methuselah. Prithee tell me, was not thou born before the flood? Truly, I should guess you to be in your second or third century. I warrant you, you have great-grandchildren with beards of a foot long. <laughs> if there be truth in man, I was but five-and-thirty last August. Oh, the study of the occult sciences makes a man's beard grow faster than you would imagine. What an escape you have had, Mr. Tinsel, that you were not bred a scholar. And so I fancy, Doctor, thou thinkst me an illiterate fellow because I have a smooth chin. Hark ye, sir, a word in your ear. You are a coxcomb by all the rules of physiognomy. But let that be a secret between you and me. Pray, Mr. Tinsel, what is it the doctor whispers? Only a compliment, child, upon two or three of my features. It does not become me to repeat it. Pray, doctor, examine this gentleman's face, and tell me his fortune. If I may believe the lines of his face, he likes it better than I do. Then you do, fair lady. Widow, I hope now thou art convinced he's a cheat. For my part, I believe he's a witch. Go on, doctor. He will be crossed in love, and that soon. Prithee, doctor, tell us the truth. Dost not thou live in more fields? Take my word for it. Thou shalt never live in my Lady Truman's mansion house. Pray, old gentleman, hast thou never been plucked by the beard when thou wert saucy? Nay, Mr. Tinsel, you are angry. Do you think that I would marry a man that dares not have his fortune told? Let him be angry. I matter not. He is short-lived. He will soon die of... Come, come, speak out, old hocus. <laughs> this fellow makes me burst with laughing. <laughs> he will soon die of fright. Or of the... Let me see your nose. Uh, I tis so. You son of a whore. I'll run ye through the body. I never yet made the sun shine through a conjurer. Oh, fie, Mr. Tinsel. You will not kill an old man. An old man? The dog says he's but five and thirty. Oh, fie, Mr. Tinsel. I did not think you could have been so passionate. I hate a passionate man. Put up your sword, or I must never see you again. <laughs> I was but in jest, my dear. I had a mind to have made an experiment upon the doctor's body. I would but have drilled a little eyelet hole in it, and have seen whether he had art enough to close it up again. Courage is but ill shown for a lady. But know if ever I meet thee again, thou shalt find this arm can wield other weapons besides this wand. <laughs> well, learned sir, you are to give a proof of your art, not of your courage. Or if you will show your courage, let it be at nine o'clock, for that is the time the noise is generally heard. And look ye, old gentleman, if thou dost not do thy business well, I can tell thee by the little skill I have that thou wilt be tossed in a blanket before ten. We'll do our endeavour to send thee back to the stars again. I'll go and prepare myself for the ceremonies, and, lady, as you expect, they should succeed your wishes. Treat that fellow with the contempt he deserves. Exit Sir George. The sauciest dog I've ever talked with in my whole life. Methinks he's a diverting fellow. One may see he's no fool. No fool? Aye, but thou dost not take him for a conjurer. Truly, I don't know what to take him for. I am resolved to employ him, however. When a sickness is desperate, we often try remedies that we have no great faith in. Enter Abigail. Madam, the tea is ready in the parlour as you ordered. Come, Mr. Tinsel, we may there talk of this subject more at leisure. Exeunt Lady Truman and Tinsel. Abigail Sola. 
Sure never any lady had such servants as mine has. Well, if I get this thousand pound, I hope to have some of my own. Let me see. I'll have a pretty tight girl, just such as I was ten years ago. I'm afraid I may say twenty. She shall dress me and flatter me, for I will be flattered, that's pos. My lady's cast suits will serve her after I have given them the wearing. Besides, when I'm worth a thousand pound, I shall certainly carry off the steward, Madam Vellum. How prettily that will sound! Here, bring out Madam Vellum's chaise. Nay, I do not know, but it may be a chariot. I will break the attorney's wife's heart, for I shall take place of everybody in the parish but my lady. If I have a son, he shall be called Fantôme. But see, Mr. Vellum, as I could wish. I know his humour, and will do my utmost to gain his heart. Enter Vellum with a pint of sack. Mistress Abigail, don't I break in upon you unseasonably? Oh, no, Mr. Vellum, your visits are always seasonable. I have brought with me a taste of fresh canary, which I think is delicious. Pray set it down. I have a dram glass just by. Brings in a rummer. I'll pledge you. My lady's good health. And your own with it, sweet Mistress Abigail. Pray, good Mr. Vellum, buy me a little parcel of this sack and put it under the article of tea. I would not have my name appear to it. Mistress Abigail, your name seldom appears in my bills. And yet, if you will allow me a merry expression, you have been always in my books, Mistress Abigail. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Vellum, you're such a dry jesting man. Why, truly, Mistress Abigail, I have been looking over my papers, and I find you have been a long time my debtor. Your debtor? For what, Mr. Vellum? For my heart, Mistress Abigail, and our accounts will not be balanced between us till I have yours in exchange for it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you are the most gallant done, Mr. Vellum. But I am not used to being paid by words only, Mistress Abigail. When will you be out of my debt? Oh, Mr. Vellum, you make one blush. My humble service to you. I must answer you, Mistress Abigail, in the country phrase. Your love is sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must own I love a merry man. Let me see. How long is it, Mistress Abigail, since I first broke my mind to you? It was, I think, undecimo guliami. We have conversed together these fifteen years, and yet, Mistress Abigail, I must drink to our better acquaintance. <laughs> Mistress Abigail, you know I am naturally jocose. Ah, oh, you men love to make sport with us silly creatures. Mistress Abigail, I have a trifle about me, which I would willingly make you a present of. It is indeed but a little toy. You are always exceedingly obliging. It is but a little toy, scarce worth your acceptance. Pray do not keep me in suspense. What is it, Mr. Vellum? A silver thimble. I always said Mr. Vellum was a generous lover. But I must put it on myself, Mistress Abigail. You have the prettiest tip of a finger. I must take the freedom to salute it. Oh, fie, you make me ashamed, Mr. Vellum. How can you do so? I protest I am in such a confusion. A feigned struggle. This finger is not the finger of idleness. It bears the honorable scars of the needle. But why are you so cruel as not to pare your nails? Oh, I vow you press it so hard. Pray give me my finger again. This middle finger, Mistress Abigail, has a pretty neighbor. A wedding ring would become it mightily. <laughs> You're so full of your jokes. Ay, but where must I find one for it? I design this thimble only as the forerunner of it. They will set off each other, and are, indeed, a twofold emblem. 
the first will put you in mind of being a good housewife, and the other of being a good wife. <laughs> yes, yes, I see you laugh at me. Indeed, I am serious. I thought you had quite forsaken me. I am sure you cannot forget the many repeated vows and promises you formerly made me. I should as soon forget the multiplication table. I have always taken your part before my lady. You have so, and I have itemed it on my memory. For I have always looked upon your interest as my own. It is nothing but your cruelty can hinder them from being so. Abigail aside. I must strike while the iron's hot. Well, Mr. Vellum, there is no refusing you. You have such a bewitching tongue. How? Speak that again. Why then, in plain English, I love you. I'm overjoyed. I must own my passion for you. I'm transported. Catches her in his arms. Dear charming man. Thou sum total of all my happiness. I shall grow extravagant. I can't forbear to drink thy virtuous inclinations in a bumper of sack. Your lady must make haste, my duck, or we shall provide a young steward to the estate before she has an heir to it. Prithee, my dear, does she intend to marry Mr. Tinsel? Marry him? My love, no, no, we must take care of that. There would be no staying in the house for us if she did. That young rakehell would send all the old servants a-grazing. You and I should be discarded before the honeymoon was at an end. Pretty sweet one, does not this drum put the thoughts of marriage out of her head? This drum, my dear, if it be well managed, will be no less than a thousand pound in our way. Aye, sayest thou so, my turtle? Ah, since we are now as good as man and wife, I mean, almost as good as man and wife, I ought to conceal nothing from you. Certainly, my dove, not from thy yoke fellow, thy helpmate, Thy own flesh and blood. Hush! I hear Mr. Tinsel's laugh. My lady and he are coming this way. If you will take a turn without, I'll tell you the whole contrivance. Give me your hand, chicken. Here, take it. You have my heart already. We shall have much issue. Exeunt. End of Act Three. Act Four of The Drummer, or The Haunted House, by Joseph Addison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four. Enter Vellum and Butler. John, I have certain orders to give you, and therefore be attentive. Attentive? I. Let me alone for that. Aside. <laughs> I suppose he means being sober. You know I have always recommended to you a method in your business. I would have your knives and forks, your spoons and napkins, your plate and glasses, laid in a method. Ah, Master Vellum, you are such a sweet-spoken man. It does one's heart good to receive your orders. Method, John, makes business easy. It banishes all perplexity and confusion out of families. <laughs> How he talks. I could hear him all day. And now, John, let me know whether your table linen, your sideboard, your cellar, and everything else within your province are properly and methodically disposed for an entertainment this evening. Master Vellum, they shall be ready at quarter of an hour's warning. But pray, sir, is this entertainment to be made for the conjurer? It is, John, for the conjurer. And yet it is not for the conjurer. Why, look you, Master Vellum, if it is for the conjurer, the cookmaid should have orders to get him some dishes to his palate. Perhaps he may like a little brimstone in his sauce. This conjurer, John is a complicated creature, an amphibious animal, a person of a twofold nature. But he eats and drinks like other men. Mary, Master Vellum, 
he should eat and drink as much as two other men by the account you give of him. Thy conceit is not amiss. He is indeed a double man. <laughs> <laughs> I understand you. He's one of your hermaphrodites, as they call him. He is married, and he is not married. He hath a beard, and he hath no beard. He is old, and he is young. <laughs> How charmingly he talks. I fancy, Master Vellum, you can make a riddle. The same man, old and young. How do you make that out, Master Vellum? Thou hast heard of a snake casting his skin and recovering his youth? Such is this sage person. Nay, it is no wonder a conjurer should be like a serpent. When he has thrown aside the old conjurer's slow that hangs about him, he'll come out as fine a young gentleman as ever was seen in this house. Does he intend to sup in his slough? That time will show. Well, I have not a head for these things. Indeed, Master Vellum, I have not understood one word you have said this half hour. I did not intend thou shouldest. But to our business. Let there be a table spread in the great hall. Let your pots and glasses be washed, and in a readiness. Bid the cook provide a plentiful supper, and see that all the servants be in their best liveries. Ay, now I understand every word you say. But I would rather hear you talk a little in that other way. I shall explain to thee what I have said by and by. Bid Susan lay two pillows upon her lady's bed. Two pillows? Madam won't sleep upon them both. She is not a double woman, too. She will sleep upon neither. But hark, Mistress Abigail, I think I hear her chiding the cookmaid. Then I'll away, or it will be my turn next. She, I'm sure, speaks plain English. <laughs> One may easily understand every word she says. Exit Butler. Vellum Solus. Servants are good for nothing, unless they have an opinion of the person's understanding who has the direction of them. But see, Mistress Abigail, she has a bewitching countenance. I wish I may not be tempted to marry her in good earnest. Enter Abigail. Ha! Mr. Vellum! What brings my sweet one hither? I am coming to speak to my friend behind the wainscot. It is fit, child, he should have an account of this conjurer, that he should not be surprised. That would be as much as thy thousand pound is worth. I'll speak low. Walls have ears. Pointing at the wainscot. But hark you, duckling. Be sure you do not tell him that I am let into the secret. That's a good one indeed. As if I should ever tell what passes between you and me. No, no, my child, that must not be. <laughs> that must not be. <laughs> you will always be waggish. Adieu, and let me hear the result of your conference. How can you leave one so soon? I shall think it an age till I see you again. Adieu, my pretty one. Adieu, sweet Mr. Vellum. My pretty one. As he is going off. Dear Mr. Vellum. My pretty one. Exit Vellum. Abigail Sola. I have him, if I can but get this thousand pound. Ha! Ah! Three raps upon the drum, the signal Mr. Phantom and I agreed upon when he had a mind to speak with me. Very well, I hear you. Come, Fox, come out of your hole. Scene opens, and Phantom comes out. You may leave your drum in the wardrobe till you have occasion for it. Well, Mistress Abigail, I want to hear what is a doing in the world. You are a very inquisitive spirit. But I must tell you, if you do not take care of yourself, you will be laid this evening. I have overheard something of that matter. But let me alone for the doctor. I'll engage to give a good account of him. I am more in pain about tinsel. When a lady's in the case, I'm more afraid of one fop than twenty conjurers. 
to tell you truly he presses his attacks with so much impudence that he has made more progress with my lady in two days than you did in two months i shall attack her in another manner if thou canst but procure me another interview there's nothing that makes a lover so keen as being kept up in the dark pray no more of your distant bows your respectful compliments really mr phantom you're only fit to make love across a tea-table my dear girl i can't forbear hugging thee for thy good advice ay now i have some hopes for you but why don't you do so to my lady child i always thought your lady loved to be treated with respect believe me mr phantom there is not so great a difference between woman and woman as you imagine you see tinsel has nothing but his sauciness to recommend him tinsel is too great a coxcomb to be capable of love and let me tell thee abigail a man who is sincere in his passion makes but a very awkward profession of it but i'll mend my manners ay or you'll never gain a widow come i must tutor you a little suppose me to be my lady and let me see how you'll behave yourself i'm afraid child we haven't time for such a piece of mummery oh it will be quickly over if you play your part well well then dear mistress ab i mean lady truman ay but you hadn't saluted me that's right faith i forgot that circumstance kisses her nectar and ambrosia that's very well how long must i be condemned to languish when shall my sufferings have an end my life my happiness my all is wound up in you well why don't you squeeze my hand what thus thus ay now throw your arm about my middle hug me closer oh, you're not afraid of hurting me now pour forth a volley of rapture and nonsense till you are out of breath transport and ecstasy where am i my life my bliss i rage i burn i bleed i die go on go on flames and darts bear me to the gloomy shade rocks and grottoes flowers zephyrs and purling streams oh mr phantom you have a tongue who'd undo a vestal you were born for the ruin of our sex this will do then abigail ay this is talking like a lover though i only represent my lady i take a pleasure in hearing you well o'er my conscience when a man of sense has a little dash of the coxcomb in him no woman can resist him go on at this rate and the thousand pound is as good as in my pocket now i shall think it an age till i have an opportunity of putting this lesson in practice you may do it soon if you make good use of your time mr tinsel will be here with my lady at eight and at nine the conjurer is to take you in hand let me alone with both of them well forewarned forearmed get into your box and i'll endeavour to dispose everything in your favour phantom goes in exit abigail enter vellum mistress abigail is withdrawn i was in hopes to have heard what passes between her and her invisible correspondent enter tinsel vellum 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 aside vellum we are methinks very familiar i am not used to being called so by any but their honours what would you mr tinsel let me beg a favour of the old gentleman what is that good sir prithee run and fetch me the rent-roll of thy lady's estate the rent-roll the rent-roll ay the rent-roll dost not understand what that means why have you thoughts of purchasing of it thou hast hit it old boy that is my very intention 
The purchase will be considerable. And for that reason I have bid thy lady very high. She is to have no less for it than this entire person of mine. Is your whole estate personal, Mr. Tinsel? <laughs> Why, you queer old dog, you don't pretend to jest, do ye? Look ye, Vellum, if you think of being continued my steward, you must learn to walk with your toes out. Vellum aside. An insolent companion. Thou art confounded rich, I see, by that dangling of thy arms. An ungracious bird. Thou shalt lend me a couple of thousand pounds. A fairy profligate. Look ye, Vellum, I intend to be kind to you. I'll borrow some money of you. I cannot but smile to consider the disappointment this young fellow will meet with. I will make myself marry with him. And so, Mr. Tinsel, you promise you will be a very kind master to me? Stifling a laugh. What will you give for a life in the house you live in? What do you think of five hundred pounds? <laughs> That's too little. And yet it is more than I shall give you. And I will offer you two reasons for it. Prithee, what are they? First, because the tenement is not in your disposal. And secondly, because it never will be in your disposal. And so fare you well, good Mr. Tinsel. <laughs> you will pardon me for being jocular. Exit Vellum. This rogue is as saucy as a conjurer. I'll be hanged if they are not akin. Enter Lady Truman. Mr. Tinsel, what, all alone? You free thinkers are great admirers of solitude. No, Faith, I have been talking with thy steward, a very grotesque figure of a fellow, the very picture of one of our benchers. How can you bear his conversation? I keep him for my steward and not my companion. He's a sober man. Yes, yes, he looks like a put. A queer old dog as ever I saw in my life. We must turn him off, widow. He cheats thee confoundedly, I see that. Indeed, you're mistaken. He has always had the reputation of being a very honest man. What? I suppose he goes to church. Goes to church? So do you too, I hope. I would for once, widow, to make sure of you. Ah, Mr. Tinsel, a husband who would not continue to go thither would quickly forget the promises he made there. Faith, very innocent and very ridiculous. Well, then, I warn thee, widow, thou wouldst not for the world marry a Sabbath-breaker. Truly, they generally come to a bad end. I remember the conjurer told you you were short-lived. <laughs> the conjurer. <laughs> Indeed, you're very witty. Indeed, you're very handsome. Kisses her hand. Lady Truman aside. I wish the fool does not love me. Thou art the idol I adore. How must I pay my devotion? Prithee, widow, hast thou any timber upon thy estate? The most impudent fellow I ever met with. I take notice thou hast a great deal of old plate here in the house, widow. Mr. Tinsel, you are a very observing man. Thy large silver cistern would make a very good coach, and half a dozen salvers that I saw on the sideboard might be turned into six as pretty horses as any that appear in the ring. You have a very good fancy, Mr. Tinsel. What pretty transformations you could make in my house. Aside. But I'll see where it will end. Then, I observe, child, you have two or three services of gilt plate. We'd eat always in China, my dear. I perceive you are an excellent manager. How quickly you have taken an inventory of my goods. Now hark you, widow, to show you the love that I have for you. Very well, let me hear. You have an old-fashioned gold caudal cup with the figure of a saint upon the lid on it. I have. What then? Why, look here. I'd sell the caudal cup with the old saint for as much money as they'd fetch, which I would convert into a diamond buckle and make you a present of it. Oh, you are generous to an extravagance. But pray, Mr. Tinsel, don't dispose of my goods before you are sure of my person. I find you have taken a great affection to my movables. My dear, I love everything that belongs to you. I see you do, sir. You need not make any protestations upon that subject. Foe, foe, my dear, we are grown serious. And let me tell you, that's the very next step to being dull. Come, that pretty face was never made to look grave with. 
Believe me, sir, whatever you may think, marriage is a serious subject. For that very reason, my dear, let us get over it as fast as we can. I should be very much in haste for a husband if I married within fourteen months after Sir George's decease. Pray, my dear, let me ask you a question. Dost not thou think that Sir George is as dead at present, to all intents and purposes, as he will be a twelve month hence? Yes, but decency, Mr. Tinsel. Or dost thou think thou would be more a widow then than thou art now? The world would say I never loved my first husband. Ah, oh, my dear, they would say you loved your second, and they would own I deserved it, for I shall love thee most inordinately. But what would people think? Think? Why, they would think thee the mirror of widowhood, that a woman should live fourteen whole months after the decease of a spouse without having engaged herself. Why? About town we know many a woman of quality second husband several years before the death of the first. Aye, I know you wits have your commonplace jests upon us poor widows. I'll tell you a story, widow. I know a certain lady who, considering the craziness of her husband, had, in case of mortality, engaged herself to two young fellows of my acquaintance. They grew such desperate rivals for her while her husband was alive that one of them pinked the other in a duel— but the good lady was no sooner a widow, but what did my dowager do? Why, faith, being a woman of honour, she married a third, to whom, it seems, she had given her first promise. And this is a true story upon your own knowledge? Every tittle, as I hoped to be married, or never believe Tom Tinsel. Pray, Mr. Tinsel, do you call this talking like a wit, or like a rake? Innocent enough. <laughs> Why, where's the difference, my dear? Yes, Mr. Tinsel, the only man I ever loved in my life had a great deal of the one and nothing of the other in him. Nay, hey, now you grow vapourish. Thou'd begin to fancy thou hearst the drum by and by. If you had been here last night about this time, you would not have been so merry. About this time, sayest thou? Come, Faith, for the humour's sake, we'll sit down and listen. I will, if you'll promise to be serious. Serious? Never fear me, child. <laughs> Dost not hear him? You break your word already. Pray, Mr. Tinsel, do you laugh to show your wit or your teeth? Why both, my dear? Aside. I'm glad, however, that she has taken notice of my teeth. But you look serious, child. I fancy thou hearst the drum, dost not? Don't talk so rashly. Why, my dear, you could not look more frighted if you had Lucifer's drum major in your house. Mr. Tinsel, I must desire to see you no more in it if you do not leave this idle way of talking. Child, I thought I had told you what is my opinion of spirits as we were drinking a dish of tea but just now. There is no such thing, I give thee my word. Oh, Mr. Tinsel, your authority must be of great weight to those that know you. For my part, child, I have made myself easy in those points. Lady Truman, aside. Sure nothing was ever like this fellow's vanity but his ignorance. I'll tell thee what now, widow. I would engage by the help of a white sheet and a pennyworth of link in a dark night to frighten you a whole country village out of their senses and the vicar into the bargain. Hark! Hark! What noise is that? Heaven defend us. This is more than fancy. It beats more terrible than ever. T Tis very dreadful. What a dog have I been to speak against my conscience, only to show my parts. It comes nearer and nearer. I wish you have not angered it by your foolish discourse. Indeed, madam. I did not speak from my heart. I hope it will do me no hurt for a little harmless raillery. Harmless, do you call it? It beats hard by us, as if it would break through the wall. What a devil had I to do with a white sheet? Scene opens and discovers Phantom. Mercy on us, it appears. Oh, tis he, tis he himself. Tis Sir George, tis my husband. Ah. <sighs> she faints. Now would I give ten thousand pound that I were in town. Phantom advances to him, drumming. I beg ten thousand pardons. I'll never talk at this rate any more. Phantom still advances, drumming. 
By my soul, Sir George, I was not in earnest. Falls on his knees. Have compassion on my youth, and consider I, I am but a coxcomb. Phantom points to the door. But see, he weighs me off. I, with all my heart. What a devil had I to do with a white sheet? He steals off the stage, mending his pace as the drum beats. The scoundrel is gone, and has left his mistress behind him. I'm mistaken if he makes love in this house any more. I have now only the conjurer to deal with. I don't question, but I shall make his reverence scamper as fast as the lover, and then the day's my own. But the servants are coming. I must get into my cupboard. He goes in. Enter Abigail and servants. Oh, my poor lady, this wicked drum has frightened Mr. Tinsel out of his wits, and my lady into a swoon. Let me bend her a little forward. Ah, she revives. Here, carry her into the fresh air and she'll recover. They carry her off. This is a little barbarous to my lady, but tis all for her good and I know her so well that she would not be angry with me if she knew what I was to get by it. And if any of her friends should blame me for it hereafter, I'll clap my hand upon my purse and tell them "'Twas for a thousand pound and Mr. Vellum." End of Act Four Act Five of The Drummer, or The Haunted House, by Joseph Addison this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act V. Enter Sir George in his conjurer's habit, the butler marching before him with two large candles, and the two servants coming after him, one bringing a little table, and another a chair. And it please your worship, Mr. Conjurer. The steward has given all of us orders to do whatsoever you shall bid us, and uh, to pay you the same respect as if you were our master. Thou sayest well. And please your conjurship's worship, shall I set the table down here? Here, Peter. Gardener, aside. Peter? He knows my name by his learning. I have brought you, reverend sir, the largest elbow chair in the house. "'Tis that the steward sits in when he holds a court. "'Place it there. "'Sir, uh, will you please to want anything else?' "'Paper and a pen and ink. "'Sir, I believe we have paper that is fit for your purpose. "'My lady's morning paper that is blacked at the edges. "'Would you choose to write with a crow quill?' Uh, "'There is none better.' "'Coachman, go fetch the paper and standish out of the little parlor. Coachman to Gardener. Peter, prithee do thou go along with me. I'm afraid. You know I went with you last night into the garden, when the cookmaid wanted a handful of parsley. Why, you don't think I'll stay with the conjurer by myself? Come, we'll all three go and fetch the pen and ink together. Exeunt Servants. Sir George Solus. There's nothing I see makes such strong alliances as fear. These fellows are all entered into a confederacy against the ghost. There must be abundance of business done in the family at this rate. But here comes the triple alliance. Who could have thought that these three rogues could have found each of them in an employment in fetching a pen and ink? Enter Gardener with a sheet of paper, Coachman with a standish, and Butler with a pen. Sir, there is your paper. Sir, there is your standish. Sir, there is your crow quill pen. Aside. I'm glad I have got rid on it. Gardener, aside. He forgets that he's to make a circle. Doctor, shall I help you to a bit of chalk? It is no matter. Look ye, sir, uh, I'll show you the spot where he's heard oftenest. If your worship can but ferret him out of that old wall in the next room... Uh, we shall try. That's right, John. 
his worship must let fly all his learning at that old wall sir if i was worthy to advise you i would have a bottle of good october by me shall i set a cup of old stingo at your elbow i thank thee we shall do without it john he seems a very good-natured man for a conjurer i'll take this opportunity of acquiring after a bit of plate i have lost i fancy while he is in my lady's pay one might hedge in a question or two into the bargain sir sir may i beg a word in your ear what wouldst thou sir i know i need not tell you that i lost one of my silver spoons last week marked with a swan's neck butler aside my lady's crest he knows everything how would your worship advise me to recover it again hum what must i do to come at it drink nothing but small beer for a fortnight small beer rot gut if thou drinkest a single drop of ale before fifteen days are expired it is as much as thy spoon is worth butler aside I shall never recover it that way. I'll even buy a new one. Do ye mind how they whisper? I'll be hanged if he's not asking him something about Nell. I'll take this opportunity of putting a question to him about poor Dobbing. I fancy he could give me better counsel than the farrier. Butler to Gardner. A prodigious man. He knows everything. Now is the time to find out thy pickaxe i have nothing to give him does not he expect to have his hand crossed with silver coachman to sir george sir may a man venture to ask you a question ask it i have a poor horse in the stable that's bewitched a bay gelding coachman aside how could he know that bought at banbury woo so it was o'er my conscience whistles Six-year-old last llamas. Coachman, aside. To a day. Now, sir, I would know whether the poor beast is bewitched by Goody Crouch or Goody Fly. Neither. Then it must be Goody Girton, for she is the next oldest woman in the parish. Hast thou done, Robin? Coachman to Gardner. He can tell thee anything. Gardner to Sir George. Sir... I would beg to take you a little further out of hearing. Speak. The butter and I, Mr. Doctor, were both of us in love at the same time with a certain person. A woman. Gardner, aside. How could he know that? Go on. This woman has lately had two children at a birth. Twins. Prodigious where could he hear that proceed now because i used to meet her sometimes in the garden she has laid them both to thee what a power of learning he must have he knows everything hast thou done i would desire to know whether i am really the father of both stand before me let me survey thee round lays his wand upon his head and makes him turn about look yonder john the silly dog is turning about under the conjurer's wand if he has been saucy to him we shall see him puffed off in a whirlwind immediately twins dost thou say still turning him ay are they both mine you think own oh, but one of them ah but mistress abigail will have me take care of them both she's always for the butler if my poor master sir george had been alive he would have made him go halves with me what was sir george a kind master was he only my fellow-servants will bear me witness did ye love sir george everybody loved him there was not a dry eye in the parish at the news of his death he was the best neighbor the kindest husband the truest friend to the poor 
My good lady took on mightily. We all thought it would have been the death of her. Sir George, aside. I protest these fellows melt me. I think the time long till I am their master again, that I may be kind to them. Enter Vellum. Have you provided the doctor everything he has occasion for? If so, you may depart. Exeunt servants. Sir George, aside. I can as yet see no hurt in my wife's behavior, but still have some certain pangs and doubts that are natural to the heart of a fond man. I must take the advantage of my disguise and be thoroughly satisfied. It would neither be for her happiness nor mine to make myself known to her till I am so. Dear Vellum, I am impatient to hear some news of my wife. How does she after her fright? It is a saying somewhere in my Lord Coke, that a widow... I ask my wife that thou talkest to me of my Lord Coke. Prithee, tell me how she does, for I am in pain for her. She is pretty well recovered. Mistress Abigail has put her in a good heart, and I have given her great hopes from your skill. That, I think, cannot fail, since you hast got this secret out of Abigail but I could not have thought my friend Fantome would have served me thus. You will still fancy you are a living man? That he should endeavor to ensnare my wife. You have no right in her. After your demise, death extinguishes all property. Quavoid honk. It is a maxim in the law. Ah, pox on your learning. Well, but what has become of Tinsel? He rushed out of the house, called for his horse, clapped spurs to his sides, and was out of sight in less time than, I can tell, ten. This is whimsical enough. My wife will have quick succession of lovers in one day. Fantome has driven out Tinsel, and I shall drive out Fantome. Even as one wedge driveth out another. <laughs> you must pardon me for being jocular. Was there ever such a provoking blockhead? But he means well well i must have satisfaction of this traitor fantome and cannot take a more proper one than by turning him out of my house in a manner that shall show shame upon him and make him ridiculous as long as he lives you must remember vellum you have abundance of business upon your hands and i have just time to tell you over all i require of you is dispatch therefore hear me there is nothing more requisite in business than dispatch uh, then hear me it is indeed the life of business hear me then i say and as one has rightly observed the benefit that attends it is fourfold first there is no bearing this thou art going to describe dispatch when thou shouldst be practising it but your honour will not give me the hearing Sir George, angrily. Thou wilt not give me the hearing. I am still. In the first place, you are to lay my wig hat and sword ready for me in the closet, and one of my scarlet coats. You know how Abigail has described the ghost to you. It shall be done. Then you must remember, whilst I am laying this ghost, you are to prepare my wife for the reception of her real husband. Tell her the whole story and do it with all the art you are master of, that the surprise may not be too great for her. It shall be done. But since her honor has seen this apparition, she desires to see you once more before you encounter it. I shall expect her impatiently, for now I can talk to her without being interrupted by that impertinent rogue, Tinsel. I hope thou hast not told Abigail anything of the secret. Mistress Abigail is a woman. There are many reasons why she should not be acquainted with it. I shall only mention six. Hush! Here she comes. Oh, my heart. Enter Lady Truman and Abigail. Sir George aside, while Vellum talks in dumb show to Lady Truman. Oh, that loved woman! How I long to take her in my arms! If I find I am still dear to her memory, it will be a return to life indeed. Ah, 
but i must take care of indulging this tenderness and put on a behaviour more suitable to my present character walks at a distance in a pensive posture waving his wand lady truman to vellum this is surprising indeed so all the servants tell me they say he knows everything that has happened in the family abigail aside a parcel of credulous fools they first tell him their secrets and then wonder how he comes to know them exit vellum exchanging fond looks with abigail learned sir may i have some conversation with you before you begin your ceremonies speak but hold first let me feel your pulse what can you learn from that i have already learned a secret from it that will astonish you pray what is it you will have a husband within this half hour abigail aside i'm glad to hear that he must mean mr fantome i begin to think there's a good deal of truth in his art alas i fear you mean i shall see sir george's apparition a second time have courage you shall see the apparition no more the husband i mentioned shall be as much alive as i am mr fantome to be sure impossible i loved my first too well you could not love the first better than you will love the second i'll be hanged if my dear steward has not instructed him he means mr fantome to be sure ah the thousand pound is our own alas you did not know sir george as well as i do myself i saw him with you in the red damask room when he first made love to you your mother left you together under the pretense of receiving a visit from mrs hawthorne on her return from london this is astonishing you were a great admirer of single life for the first half hour your refusals then grew fainter and fainter with what ecstasy did sir george kiss your hand when you told him you should always follow the advice of your mamma every circumstance to a tittle then lady the wedding night i saw you in your white satin nightgown you would not come out of your dressing-room till sir george took you out by force he drew you gently by the hand you struggled but he was too strong for you you blushed he oh stop there go no further he knows everything truly mr conjurer i believe you have been a wag in your youth mistress abigail you know what your good word cost sir george a purse of broad pieces mistress abigail the devil's in him pray sir since you have told so far you should tell my lady that i refused to take them tis true child he was forced to thrust them into your bosom this rogue will mention the thousand pound if i don't take care pray sir though you are a conjurer methinks you need not be a blab sir since i have now no reason to doubt of your art i must beseech you to treat this apparition gently it has the resemblance of my deceased husband if there be any undiscovered secret anything that troubles his rest learn it of him i must to that end be sincerely informed by you whether your heart be engaged to another have not you received the address of many lovers since his death i have been obliged to receive more visits than have been agreeable was not tinsel welcome aside i am afraid to hear an answer to my own question he was well recommended sir george aside racks of a good family tortures heir to a considerable estate ah death <laughs> and you still love him i am distracted no i despise him i found he had a design upon my fortune was base profligate cowardly and everything that could be expected from a man of the vilest principles i am recovered oh madam had you seen how like a scoundrel he looked when he left your ladyship in a swoon where have you left my lady says i in an elbow chair child says he and where are you going says i to town child says he for to tell thee truly child says he i don't care for living under the same roof with the devil says he well lady i see nothing in all this 
that may hinder Sir George's spirit from being at rest. If he knows anything of what passes in my heart, he cannot but be satisfied of that fondness which I bear to his memory. My sorrow for him is always fresh when I think of him. He was the kindest, truest, tenderest. Tears will not let me go on. This quite o'erpowers me. I shall discover myself before my time. Madam, you may now retire and leave me to myself. Success attend you. I wish Mr. Phantom gets well off from this old Don. I know he'll be with him immediately. Exeunt Lady Truman and Abigail. Sir George Solus. My heart is now at ease. She is the same dear woman I left her. Now for my revenge upon Fantome. I shall cut the ceremonies short. A few words will do his business. Now, let me seat myself in form. A good easy chair for a conjurer, this. Now, for a few mathematical scratches. A good lucky scrawl, that. Faith, I think it looks very astrological. These two or three magical pothooks about it make a complete conjurer's scheme. <laughs> Sir, are you there? Enter drummer. Now must I pour upon my paper. Enter phantom, beating his drum. Prithee, don't make a noise. I'm busy. A pretty march, prithee. Beat that over again. He beats and advances. Sir George, rising. Ha, ha! You are very perfect in the step of a ghost. You stock it majestically. Phantom advances. How oh, the rogue stares. He acts it to admiration. I'll be hanged if he has not been practicing this half hour in Mistress Abigail's wardrobe. Phantom starts, gives a rap upon his drum. Oh, prithee, don't play the fool. Nay, nay, enough of this good Mr. Fantome. Phantom aside. Death, I'm discovered. This jade Abigail has betrayed me. Mr. Fantome, upon the word of an astrologer, your thousand-pound bribe will never gain my Lady Truman. Tis plain. She has told him all. Let me advise you to make off as fast as you can. Or I plainly perceive by my art Mr. Ghost will have his bones broke. Phantom to Sir George. Look here, old gentleman. I perceive you have learnt this secret from Mistress Abigail. I have learnt it from my art. Thy art? Prithee no more of that. Look here, I know you are a cheat as much as I am. And if thou'lt keep my counsel... I'll give thee ten broad pieces. I am not mercenary. Young man, I scorn thy gold. I'll make them up twenty. Avant, and that quickly, or I'll raise such an apparition as shall... An apparition, old gentleman? You mistake your man. I am not to be frightened with bugbears. Let me retire but for a few moments and I will give thee such a proof of my art. Why, if thou hast any hocus-pocus tricks to play, why canst not do them here? The raising of a spirit requires certain secret mysteries to be performed, and word to be muttered in private. Well, if I see through your trick, will you promise to be my friend? I will. Attend and tremble. Exit. Phantom Solus. A very solemn old ass, but I smoke him. He has a mind to raise his price upon me. I could not think this slut would have used me thus. I begin to grow horribly tired of my drum. I wish I was well rid of it. However, I have got this by it, that it has driven off tinsel for good and all. I shan't have the mortification to see my mistress carried off by such a rival. 
Well, whatever happens, I must stop this old fellow's mouth. I must not be sparing in hush money. But here he comes. Enter Sir George in his own habit. Ha! What's that? Sir George Truman? This can be no counterfeit. His dress, his shape, his face, the very wound of which he died. Nay, then tis time to decamp. Runs off. <laughs> Fare you well, good Sir George. The enemy has left me master of the field. Here are the marks of my victory. This drum will hang up in my great hall as the trophy of the day. Enter Abigail. Sir George stands with his hand before his face in a musing posture. Yonder he is. Oh, my conscience, he has driven off the conjurer. Mr. Fantôme, Mr. Fantôme, I give you joy, I give you joy. What do you think of your thousand pounds now? Why does not the man speak? Pulls him by the sleeve. Sir George, taking his hand from his face. Ha! Oh! "'Tis my master!' shrieks. Running away, he catches her. "'Good Mistress Abigail, not so fast.' "'Are you alive, sir? He has given my shoulder such a cursed tweak. They must be real fingers. I feel them, I'm sure.' "'What dost think?' "'Think, sir? Think? Troth, I don't know what you think. Pray, sir, how—' "'No questions, good Abigail.' Thy curiosity shall be satisfied in due time. Where's your lady? Oh, I'm so frightened and so glad. Where's your lady, I ask you? Mary, I don't know where I am myself. I can't forbear weeping for joy. Your lady, I say your lady, I must bring you to yourself with one pinch more. Oh, she has been talking a good while with the steward. Then he has opened the whole story to her. I'm glad he has prepared her. Oh, here she comes. Enter Lady Truman, followed by Vellum. Where is he? Let me fly into his arms. My life, my soul, my husband. Oh, let me catch thee to my heart, dearest of women. Are you then still alive? And are you here? I can scarce believe my senses. Now am I happy indeed. My heart is too full to answer thee. How could you be so cruel to defer giving me that joy which you knew I must receive from your presence? You have robbed my life of some hours of happiness that ought to have been in it. It was to make our happiness the more sincere and unmixed. There will now be no doubts to dash it. What has been the affliction of our lives has given a variety to them, and will hereafter supply us with a thousand materials to talk of. I am now satisfied that it is not in the power of absence to lessen your love towards me. And I am satisfied that it is not in the power of death to destroy that love which makes me the happiest of men. Was ever woman so blessed to find again the darling of her soul when she thought him lost for ever? To enter into a kind of second marriage with the only man whom she was ever capable of loving? May it be as happy as our first. I desire no more. But believe me, my dear, I want words to express those transports of joy and tenderness which are every moment rising in my heart whilst I speak to thee. Enter servants. Just as the steward told us, lads. Look you there. If he bent with my lady already? He, he, he. What a joyful night will this be for madam. As I was coming in at the gate, a strange gentleman whisked by me. But he took to his heels and made away to the George. If I did not see Master before me, I should have sworn it had been his honour. Has given orders for the bells to be set ringing? Never trouble thy head about that. Tis done. Sir George to Lady Truman. My dear, long as much to tell you my whole story as you do to hear it. In the meanwhile, I am to look upon this as my wedding day. I'll have nothing but the voice of mirth and feasting in my house. My poor neighbors and my servants shall rejoice with me. My hall shall be free to everyone, and let my cellars be thrown open. Ah, oh, bless your honor. 
May you never die again. The same good man that ever he was. Wurra! Vellum, thou hast done me much service today. I know thou lovest Abigail, but she's disappointed in a fortune. I'll make it up to both of you. I'll give thee a thousand pound with her. It is not fit there should be one sad heart in my house tonight. What you do for Abigail I know is meant as a compliment to me. This is a new instance of your love. <sighs> Mr. Vellum, you are a well-spoken man. Pray do you thank my master and my lady. Vellum, I hope you are not displeased with the gift I make you. The gift is twofold. I receive from you a virtuous partner, and a portion, too, for which, in humble wise, I thank the donors, and so we bid good night to both your honors. End of Act Five. Epilogue. Tonight, the poet's advocate, I stand, and he deserves the favor at my hand, who in my equipage their cause debating has placed two lovers and a third in waiting. If both the first should from their duty swerve, there's one behind the wainscot in reserve. In his next play, if I would take this trouble, he promised me to make the number double. In troth, twas spoke like an obliging creature, for though tis simple, yet it shows good nature. My help thus asked, I could not choose but grant it, and really I thought the play would want it, void as it is of all the usual arts, to warm your fancies and to steal your hearts. No court intrigue, nor city cuckoldom, no song, no dance, no music but a drum. No smutty thought in doubtful phrase expressed, and gentlemen, if so, pray where's the jest? When we would raise your mirth, you hardly know whether in strictness you should laugh or no. But turn upon the ladies in the pit, and if they redden, you are sure tis wit. Protect him then, ye fair ones, for the fair of all conditions are his equal care. He draws a widow, who of blameless carriage, true to her jointure, hates a second marriage. And, to improve a virtuous wife's delights, out of one man contrives two wedding nights. Nay, to oblige the sex in every state, a nymph of five and forty finds her mate. Too long has marriage in this tasteless age, with ill-bred raillery, supplied the stage. No little scribbler is of wit so bare, but has his fling at the poor wedded pair. Our author deals not in conceits so stale, for should the examples of his play prevail, no man need blush, though true to marriage vows, nor be a jest, though he should love his spouse. Thus has he done you British consorts right, whose husbands, should they pry like mine to-night, would never find you in your conduct slipping, though they turned conjurers to take you tripping. End of epilogue. End of The Drummer, or The Haunted House. By Joseph Addison.